WBBOR Black Box Online Radio, coming to you from West Virginia at heart and from around the globe. In this episode, I will be discussing the serial killer Rodney Alcala, and please stick around until the end because you guys in the comments section had a very specific request, and that is a response to the following question. Should Rodney Alcala also be a suspect in the disappearance of Donna Lass, who went missing in 1970? Rodney Alcala was born under the name Rodrigo Jacques Alcala Bucor in 1943. He had a reign of terror or period of activity that went on from 1969 until 1978. This is also very typical of serial killers. I mean, a typical reign of act reign of terror or period of activity. But what's so shocking with Rodney Alcala is that he was able to get away with this for so long, and I will discuss some of that throughout the duration of the episode. Rodney Alcala was someone who was described as a very nice person in his daily life. He was described as someone who was harmless. The terms that get attributed to him from his UCLA professors were he wouldn't hurt a fly and he wouldn't hurt a flea. But in reality, he was a very vicious serial killer, and nobody knows the exact number of victims that he actually murdered. He was definitely attributed to the murders of eight people, or perhaps a better way of putting it is eight victims have been attributed to the serial killer Rodney Alcala, but he, it's possible that he murdered as many as 130 people, and the number is ab absolutely higher than eight, but he has just been linked to eight murders, and he was convicted for seven of them. But with the story of Rodney Alcala, I'm noticing a very, very particular issue that seems to happen with serial killers, and that is that even though in the descriptions of his early life it does not necessarily appear that he had the strongest cases of child abuse, but rather I suspect that there would be a very, very major issue with the lack of bonding in his family, lack of bonding with the parents. And I, I mean, that is my pure personal assessment of the situation. Rodney Alcala grew up between the United States and Mexico, and then ultimately went into the U.S. Army. And I was watching the episode that they made about him on 2020, and they talked about how this is when a lot of his destructive tendencies begin to manifest. And they didn't say these exact words, but I am quite curious to know if that could have possibly been related to the types of conditioning that people would experience in the army, meaning that he had to follow orders. Because if you've watched several episodes about serial killers on YouTube, even five of them, you will probably experience something about how serial killers do not want to feel like they are powerless. They always want to feel like they are in control of the situation. They always want to feel like they have the ability to dominate their opponents. And when someone is going to go into the army, then they have to take orders from people. They have to listen to other people, and they are around countless people who can overpower them. I mean, there are going to be numerous people in the in the military who would have either the physical capabilities to overpower somebody like Rodney Alcala, or just the simple fact that he has to follow orders because it's part of being a soldier. So I'm really quite curious to know if that affected his mental state in some way. And that would mean that he had pre-existing mental issues. That would mean that he had pre-existing conditions. And I think that that is somewhat widely accepted about Rodney Alcala, that he developed these types of destructive tendencies from a very early age. And I was also watching the program 48 Hours, which did an episode about Rodney Alcala, and they talked about how he just had urges that he chose not to fight. I mean, we're not even talking about trying to resist them. He chose not to give in to these urges. This is something that is very, very different um, among the different types of serial killers. I mean, some serial killers are driven by urges to kill, and these are these sexual predators. Other serial killers are driven by methods of calculation. They have a specific reason. And then if you want to draw out your mental Venn diagram, some serial killers have urges to kill, and others are doing it for a calculating reason. And then some are right there in the middle. They have a calculating reason, and they do have some type of sexual gratification that they get from the crimes, even if there isn't physical contact. And the examples of this would be David Berkowitz, the son of Sam Shooter, perhaps the Zodiac Killer, Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, not making an enormous amount of physical contact with the victims. 
but still experiencing some type of sexual reward in their own mind. With Rodney Alcala, things are actually very different because Rodney Alcala was a torturer. He was somebody who would strip the victims naked, and in one of his cases, perhaps the most famous case, the case of Tali Shapiro, he held her down, took off her clothes, and he used a metal bar to press against her throat while he was choking her. And this was an early instance where Rodney Alcala was interrupted because he more or less abducted an eight-year-old girl, and she was taken into a, into a house, and somebody saw the abduction take place, and she was lured into his vehicle, but somebody still thought that was suspicious, even though there wasn't an enormous amount of physical force being used, so that person decided to alert the authorities, and then he was interrupted, but what's so shocking is he's let out from prison. He is, he doesn't stay that long in jail, and you'll see this just time and time again. Rodney Alcala will go into jail, and then he will get out, and I think it's because of the concept of glib and superficial charm. When you look at the hair checklist, which is what is used to diagnose sociopathy or psychopathy, the first thing that comes up is glib or superficial charm. He just puts on the presence of being non-threatening and harmless. And even when you watch Rodney Alcala's appearance on The Dating Game, I don't know about you guys, I didn't get a single threatening vibe from him. And I don't say that about all serial killers, because one thing that I've said about Ted Bundy is that Ted Bundy is so obviously fake. Once you know that he is a serial killer... You can just see through all of his facades. You can just see how he is just some type of twisted, slimy guy who is pretending to be likable. That's my take on the subject. But I honestly don't get that vibe from Rodney Alcala. And, in fact, you could just do an enormous kind of tally sheet comparing and contrasting Ted Bundy and Rodney Alcala. I think it would fit in very nicely to something that I did in the past called the Versus series where I did psychological breakdowns and comparing and contrasting serial killers because both of them targeted women. They were lady killers. A big difference is Rodney Alcala also targeted children. And as previously stated, Rodney Alcala would strangle the victims. Ted Bundy used a couple methods, but primarily with blunt force trauma. But here's something that is very, very different. Ted Bundy received a, a 17 on Dr. Michael Stone's Hierarchy of Evil and meaning that he was a sexually motivated serial killer. The hierarchy of evil determines the severity of a serial killer's brutality. It has 22 levels, and I didn't discuss this with Dr. Michael Stone, but if Ted Bundy's a 17, absolutely, I think that Rodney Alcala would be a level 22. Level 22 is the psychopathic torture murderer. It's the most extreme level of the hierarchy of evil. And the reason why I think Rodney Alcala would be on this level is some of the other descriptions about him, not only the case of Tally Shapiro, but number one, he would strangle the victims, and then he would even revive them and let them regain consciousness just to do it again. Very clearly, he was a torturer. And when I first learned about the hierarchy of evil in Dr. Michael Stone, it was introduced to me in this way, that the perpetrator is trying to torture the victim to death. They're trying to murder them and using the process of torture. And this can be misinterpreted in a few ways. It doesn't mean that they necessarily have to die from the acts of torture. Because last week on the Serial Killer Tuesday episode, I was talking about Dean Coral, the candy man. And he was a serial killer from Texas who would commit some of his crimes by gunshot. Some of the crimes were committed by strangulation, but he would commit some crimes by gunshot. But a big thing that all of the presenters who were doing episodes on Dean Coral here on YouTube wanted to make very well known, even though it would seem like that some of the victims are dying rather quickly from the gunshot wound, they were tortured first. Absolutely, I think Dean Coral would also be a level 22 on the hierarchy of evil. And recently on this Serial Killer Tuesday segment, I've talked to you guys a lot about people who commit murders by strangulation. Rodney Alcala, the dating game killer, Dean Coro, the candy man, and even the Bayou Strangler, Ronald Dominique, who was a serial killer from Louisiana, murdered at least 23 people, primarily by strangulation, hence the name. The reason why a serial killer is doing this is he wants to physically feel the act of of murdering the person. He wants to physically feel the other person's body, particularly their neck, in his or her hands and is going to experience everything firsthand, excuse me for using that expression, but 
That's what he's trying to do. He wants to feel every ounce of their suffering, the twitching, the fighting, the resistance, having complete power over people. This ties into that statement that I made at the beginning. Did he experience some type of some type of mental shift in the army when he wasn't in a situation in which he had power over people? But also, I think that this is a this is significant of something else because not all serial killers want to experience that. Not all serial killers want to hold the victims in their hands while they are trying to murder them. A prime example of this would be the Zodiac Killer who fired some gunshots and right away would stab the victims maybe six to ten times and then just kind of walk away. And then you also have serial killers such as Thomas Neal Cream, who was a serial killer known as the Lambeth Poisoner. I talked about him a lot on the Jack the Ripper episodes because he's an alternative Jack the Ripper suspect. Well, he was a poisoner. He's committing the crimes in a very indirect way. Just because somebody has this plan for murder, a desire for murder, or some type of urge to kill, does not mean that they're going to escalate things to the level of using their own physical force to strangle somebody or to feel somebody's life ending in their own hands. But with Rodney Alcala, he just appears to be a very vicious and brutal serial killer, and he is doing all of these things. Now, the other things that are so shocking about Rodney Alcala is that he is let out of prison multiple times. And in the 2020 episode, they even talked about how he asked his parole officer if he could go on vacation to New York, and like leaving California and going on vacation to New York, and they approved it. And then he went to New York, and he committed murders there. And Rodney Alcala became what is known as a traveling serial killer. Some serial killers like to focus on a specific geographic area, one that is very uh, close to where they grew up, or maybe it's where they're currently living. Maybe they have reasons why they're choosing this geographic area. If you ever get a chance to watch the miniseries Night Sins, it was made by NBC in the 90s, and although it is fictional, it talks about how a serial killer could map out certain places, like in Night Sins, the serial killer is looking at a map and choosing different counties, but not committing the crimes in the county where he lives, looking at the counties that are surrounding him. But with Rodney Alcala, he's doing something quite different. He commits crimes in just whatever geographic location presented itself, and he would just lure women to him, and then he would commit the murders, as previously stated, more or less by abducting them, luring them to him on false pretenses, and then committing the homicides. And he also did this for a while by using the names John Berger. He used two different spellings, B-E-R-G-E-R -E -E and B-U-R-G-U-R, -E -E and that was how he avoided uh, the police and evaded capture for a while. But a traveling serial killer is someone who is very ruthless, but it's also not a complicated concept. They can evade capture by moving around from location to location. By the time people start to connect the dots and figure out what's going on, they're already gone. And a very clear example of this is Tommy Lynn Sells, who was the coast-to-coast -coast killer. Joseph Paul Franklin, the racist killer, was also a traveling serial killer. And on 2020, they really wanted to uh, reinforce a point that when Rodney Alcala was committing homicides in New York, it was a particularly, particularly dangerous time in New York City. There were countless stories of murders, particularly crimes against women that were taking place. I mean, we also have the Son of Sam operating in New York around a similar time, and they even brought that up, David Berkowitz and the um, and the shootings that he committed. So it was just, it was very difficult for the police to make sense of anything involving someone who would be a traveling serial killer. So that's something that also aided Rodney Alcala into getting away with things. But ultimately, every time he was captured, and not everybody could see could this glib and superficial facade that he put on. Lots of people figured out that he was a murderous individual, and he doesn't always give the immediately outward appearance of being threatening, but that's how these serial killers get away with it. And ultimately, Rodney Alcala was sentenced to death, but he's convicted multiple times. First, he's sentenced to death, and then he, they have an appeal, and they declare that he didn't get a fair trial, but then he was sentenced to death again, and he actually died on death row at, in 2021 at the age of 77. But Rodney Alcala once took the um, own 
um, he took the position of defending himself in court. Again, very similar to Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy wanted to defend himself, and Rodney Alcala also defended himself in court. But this is the point, again, where I would point out that Ted Bundy did it in a much more articulate and intelligent way. I do not believe that Rodney Alcala was dumb at all. It's actually some people even report that he was gifted when he was growing up, and as previously stated, his professors at UCLA thought very highly of him. But I'd noticed that just Ted Bundy was really able to capture the audience in the courtroom, and the judge openly told Ted Bundy, you would have won this case if you weren't so obviously guilty. You would have made an excellent lawyer. With Rodney Alcala, the descriptions of him in the courtroom seem somewhat silly. Firstly, he didn't even deny that he committed all of the murders, and also he would start walking around being the lawyer, then he would sit down and take the stand and go through the um, role of being the defendant, and it sounds more like a circus rather than a serious attempt to serve as his own defense attorney. But I think that this just goes to show that he wasn't as cunning as he thought that he was. He wasn't as skillful as he thought he was, and he's just kind of living in this own twisted world of um, self-serving attitudes and desires, and that's the way that so many of these serial killers function. In fact, maybe every serial killer that I've mentioned in this episode would fall into that category. Serial killers commit these crimes because of a self-serving desire to dominate, to unleash some type of traumatic experience from their own lives onto other people. Again, they can have calculating reasons, but it all goes back to giving them what they want, and that is the ability to control and destroy other people. Absolutely sickening. But if there are other serial killer cases you would like to hear about on this channel, you can put your ideas in the comment section down below. You can also hit the like button and subscribe. It really helps out Black Box Online Radio. And if you would like to, you can make a donation or contribution to help support the show at buymeacoffee.com. Buymeacoffee.com slash blackboxnid88. There's a link to that in the description box. And anybody who makes a donation will get a shout out on Zodiac Monday. Every Monday I do a segment about the Zodiac Killer. And recently on Zodiac Monday, I was talking about Steve Hodell, who is the author of several different books, including the Black Dahlia Avenger series, as well as Most Evil, also much like the um, show that Dr. Michael Stone did that was called Most evil about the hierarchy of evil and steve hodell was one of the arresting officers in the case of rodney alcala as previously stated rodney alcala was using the alias john Berger, and he was actually working at a summer camp for girls in new hampshire and somebody recognized a wanted poster that was in a post office and Steve Hodell was the detective that was on the trail of the dating game killer, and he flew out, and then he arrested Rodney Alcala and then brought him back to California. I had the opportunity to correspond with Steve Hodell about this once, and he said that, unfortunately, Rodney Alcala what did not stay in prison that long, and then he went on to kill at least ten people. Now, it says that he's attributed to eight... Eight murders have been attributed to him. I always mess up that sentence. But Steve Hodell said very clearly that he killed at least ten people after he got out on that particular time. And I tend to believe Steve Hodell on that one because not only was he a detective on the case, but based on the amount of evidence they have that Rodney Alcala was committing additional murders, I think that this just goes to show that he was targeting people at any any opportune moment. He was an opportunistic sexual predator, an opportunistic serial killer. These types of individuals do indeed exist. And also they are they are very, very very good at hiding in the shadows. And I'm reminded of the story of John Arthur Aykroyd, who's the subject of the documentary Ghost of Highway 20. He was a serial killer who was only convicted for one murder, the murder of Kay Turner. But he abducted a woman once, and she just said there was not a single thing that was threatening about him. He just offered her a ride, and she's just like, there was nothing threatening about him at all, but then he tried to murder her. Thankfully, she was able to get away, and I have an episode about him, serial killer John Aykroyd, the Ghost of Highway 20. But with Steve Hodell's um, discussions on this exact subject are featured in both 48 Hours and 2020, and he says that he was the one who interviewed the professors at UCLA, and they said, nope, you've got the wrong guy. Rodney Alcala couldn't be guilty of these murders because he's just a bright, gifted, nice individual. That's where you get the quotations. He wouldn't hurt a fly. He wouldn't hurt a flea. But... I don't think that that has any relevance at all on serial killer behavior. Serial killers, as well as murderers in general, all are able to deceive people. I mean, look at the guy that was responsible for the Idaho quadruple homicide. Look at James Holmes, the 
or a Colorado shooter. They also said that he was a gifted individual, brilliant neuroscience student, went on to become one of America's deadliest mass shooters. And what about somebody like Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber, PhD in mathematics? Yes, Ted Kaczynski was brilliant, very high IQ, but he was also a serial killer and a domestic terrorist. And I was so surprised that Steve Hodel was on national television talking about this concept of how people think that Rodney Alcala couldn't have been the dating game killer because he was someone who was very intelligent, gifted, nice, hardworking, non-threatening. When Steve Hodel has now put out four books about how his own father, George Hill Hodel, was a serial killer, he accuses his own father of being a serial killer, and his father had an IQ of 186. Being gifted does not mean that somebody has a moral compass. Being gifted and intelligent and having a high IQ doesn't mean that somebody is going to be nice and caring and generous with psychopathy. It just functions in a completely different way. And they do genuinely believe that Rodney Alcala was a psychopath. He seemed like someone who was intelligent, not as intelligent as some of the serial killers that I just, li just listed off, and also not as articulate as some of the other serial killers that I've talked about, particularly Ted Bundy. So he just seems like someone, yeah, okay, he's a little bit smart, but just a mediocre person. But one of the things that I find that is so frustrating about these discussions on serial killers that I've been having recently is there's absolutely no reason for this. Absolutely no reason for Rodney Alcala to have committed these crimes. He could have just been a normal, hardworking individual and gone on to live a wonderful, boring life. Why on earth would somebody do this? I mean, I know why. It's because he didn't feel remorse when he was torturing people, and he did it to fuel a particular type of sociopathic urge that is found in numerous serial killers. But he didn't have to do any of this. There are serial killers out there who are genuine deadbeats, like Anthony Robinson, the shopping cart killer, who would bring women, women to hotels and be doing drugs with them, and then he would murder them, and he used the shopping cart to dispose of at least two of the bodies. Arthur Bomar, the Stone Cold Killer, would be another example of a degenerate. He would sneak up behind people and just kind of tap their bumper in his car like he's driving behind them, rear-ends them just a little bit, but not enough to damage his car. And then, once they would get out to talk about what just happened, he would murder the women degenerates, and these guys were just absolute uh, scumbags, and Rodney Alcala was a scumbag, too. It's just, he was somebody who could have lived a normal life, but he consciously chose not to because of his own twisted um, inability to fight these urges, or the choice, as they said, as they said on 48 Hours, the choice not to fight these urges, because I mean, can I just throw in an interjection about 48 hours? I really do appreciate everything that's been done on that program by Aaron Moriarty and Harold Dow. But overall, I think that 48 hours is a good program when they have a story. Like, say, for example, somebody's on trial and you want to find out, are they guilty or are they innocent? Maybe there's been a single murder that's been committed and is this person telling the truth or not? I think that shows like 48 hours and to a certain extent 2020 and Dateline. But 48 hours is very good at sharing those types of stories. But when it comes to a serial killer narrative, there are always going to be details that get left out and details that go on to um, get sort of blended in and things that do not get truly represented and also also not giving full attention to the victims and then it becomes more about the killer himself so on that note i would like to just say a big rest in peace to some of the victims of rodney alcala jill barkham who was murdered in 1977 and charlotte lamb who was murdered in 1978 and georgia wixted who was murdered in 1978 as well, and Jill Parenteau, who was murdered in 1979, and Robin Samso, who was murdered in 1979 as well. Robin Samso was only 12 when she was um, murdered, and as previously stated, Tally Shapiro was 8 years old when Rodney Alcala attacked her. Very clearly, Rodney Alcala was a pedophile. He was someone who targeted females all across the age spectrum. But I told you guys at the end of the episode I would discuss his possible involvement in the disappearance of Donna Lass. And now Ted Bundy is also a suspect in the disappearance of Donna Lass, and I have a standalone episode on that theory that I invite you to listen to on this channel. It says Donna Lass, possible Ted Bundy victim. And that is a theory that other people have brought forward. But with Rodney Alcala, 
there has to be some set of preconditions. Number one, we would have to be able to place him in the Lake Tahoe region at the time that Donna Lass went missing in 1970. I mean, that does fit with Rodney Alcala's Rodney Alcala's um, reign of terror activity, 1969 to 1979. But also that Rodney Alcala would have to be placed there. Donna Lass worked at the Sarah Tahoe Hotel and Casino in State Line, Nevada, which is right across from South Lake Tahoe, California. And the second point would be, I actually think that this is something in favor of Rodney Alcala being the perpetrator of the Donna Lass abduction, and that is that he was a traveling serial killer. That is definitely a strong point. He would target females. He was good at luring females to him. He was also somebody who was good at making up stories. And he, as I said, came across as non-threatening. I mean, those are all solid points. But was he actually in the vicinity of the crime? Donna Lass went missing on September 6th of 1970, and... She has more or less vanished off the face of the earth. Nobody has seen her since, and it becomes very um, difficult to uh, look at any particular suspect. Now, I think there are better suspects in the disappearance of Donna Lass. One of them would be named Lawrence Kane. Lawrence Kane is a man who worked in the Sahara Tahoe Hotel and Casino. He worked in the real estate office. Donna Lass worked at the nurse's station. And I had the opportunity to receive a comment from Sandy Betts, who, who is the author of the Zodiac Killer 2023 guide, and she said that she attended the 50th anniversary of the Sahara Tahoe Hotel, which has now since been re renamed the Hard Rock Hotel, and she heard from people directly that Lawrence Kane knew Donna Lass and that he had tried to date her, or he had he had made comments to her in somewhat of a suggestive way, so they say. I think Lawrence Kane is a better suspect than Rodney Alcala. But with Rodney Alcala, I would be very curious to look at his photos, and he, he has photos of possibly 130 murder victims, and is there one that would resemble Donna Lass? That could be something that I would investigate in the future, but absolutely she fits his M.O. and his um, the type of victim that he would have targeted. Someone who is working in perhaps the nurse's station at roughly 1.45 in the morning, maybe 1.50 in the morning, and then just comes over and then he wants to say something. You know, actually that could be a strike against Rodney Alcala because Rodney Alcala was a very avid photographer. And he would even target people in broad daylight, as previously stated Robin Samso, and he would walk up to them and say that he is a photographer. Oh, he works for a magazine. Can I take your picture? Sometimes he would even say that it's for a project, and I don't know if he would do that to Donna Lass at the Sahara Tahoe in, um, at uh, roughly 2 o'clock in the morning, so that might be a strike against him. For that, I would think that the serial killer would say something to the effect of, there's an emergency in the parking lot, I need your help right now, let's go, or they would just be trying to lure her to a dead spot in the in the hotel where they were either certain or mostly certain that there wouldn't be any security cameras. Now, all of that, I think, is in Rodney Alcala's wheelhouse, but I I just think there's insufficient evidence to say that he abducted Donna Lass, but that's my own take on the subject. And once again, if you guys have true crime questions that you're curious about, please write them in the section down below, and I will try my best to evaluate them, look at the pros and the cons, the things that are for and against. And overall, what do you think about Rodney Alcala as a serial killer? What do you think about anything that I've discussed in this episode. Do you agree with my assessment? Do you agree with any of the observations that I've made? Do you agree with what I said about how maybe he experienced powerlessness when he was dealing with drill sergeants in the army? Maybe he felt like he couldn't fight these urges, or he actively chose to give in to his urges because he wanted to murder people in a self-serving way. And going back to fictional sources, I was watching an episode of Criminal Minds once, the TV show, and they said something during an interrogation. I mean, there are the people on the other side of the glass, and they said, he's a sociopath. He's going to try and talk his way out of it. And I think all of that is true with Rodney Alcala. I think that he was um, absolutely a sociopathic or psychopathic serial killer, and he would just try and talk his way out of problems. He even took, you know, served as his own defense attorney at one point, not very successfully. I mean, he lost the, the trial. And as I said, a big difference between him and Ted Bundy is Rodney Alcala didn't even put on a very convincing performance for 
the people in the courtroom. But that is my honest take on the subject, and if you want to challenge me on anything, put your ideas in the comment section down below. Are there any other serial killers that you would like covered for Serial Killer Tuesday? And as stated, I do an episode about the Zodiac every Monday. I'm going to have more guests on the show to be discussing um, not only serial killers, but things involving the Zodiac Killer mystery, other cases like the disappearance of Don Lass, and a lot of this will tie in to um, just a larger understanding of humanity in general. But that will be all for me now. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box, and I will see you over on Instagram, blackboxnet88. Until next time.